Yep. Hello, everybody. Welcome to your final edition of the Trader Merlin Show for 2021. That's right. Lisa says, tonight is the last show for the year. That it is. We'll be off Thursday, Friday, uh, rebalancing, recalculating, doing all kinds of stuff that we need to do to get that year rolling. So uh, just a nice cheers and a shout out. It's funny because I mentioned uh, this, the Bibb and Tucker whiskey, and I've received several bottles. So, uh, Lori, thank you very much. Aaron and Darian, thank you very much for the bottle as well. Uh, I will be drinking to you right now since this is kind of my Friday show. So cheers to everybody. Mm. Now, I've been bugging my next guest for quite some time to come on the show, but he's buried in work, 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 work. And hopefully we can have a little bit of play every now and again, because as Jack Nicholson will tell you in The Shining, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. So here to join me <laughs> for, I guess, our our wrap up, our end of year, uh, a goodbye 2021. As you guys can see, our matching lab coats. We took this picture back when COVID started. So a little bit of a uh, two, two years ago, almost. So we, we look a little bit different. Uh, we both have a lot more gray hair just because the year was one hell of a year. Here to join me, we've got Larry M. Jacobson. Larry, how you doing, my friend? Good, buddy. How you doing, Marlon? Good Great. to be here uh, with everybody. I think I started the year with you, too, so I'm kind of the bookends for you. You are. You're, the, you're my bookend. And you got a Terp shirt on there? What's going on? Are we in Maryland? I went to Maryland, so I decided today was a good day to wear a nice sweatshirt, you know? It's chilly out there gotta, in the world today. Got to keep it cozy in sunny California, right? Exactly. It's been crazy. So, Larry, let's talk a little bit about uh, – there, there's so many things we could go into. And, of course, uh, for the group out there, I know we probably have some new people as well. If you are new and you want to send in questions, just do question marks before you type in your question to Larry and I. That way I can scroll through very quickly and see what is what. Um, let's start off with just a quick overview of 2021. Was there any, like, major high note pieces for you that you're like, wow, this was kind of a game changer or something very uh, noteworthy? You know, I, I just think – the thing, the two things that really kind of went under the radar for me this year, which I'm definitely focused on in 2022, which is no surprise. One is the supply chain. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, no one's really talking about it. But if you go to the markets, and especially if you have a pet right now, good luck finding food. And there's really no explanation other than it's going to be okay. And the second thing that I think's really been out there is inflation. Yeah. And you know, it's unbelievable to me that. You know, nobody's really addressing something that can be incredibly dangerous if not handled well, because if it gets out of control, all of a sudden there is the bubble that everyone's been waiting for. And if you go online, it's very interesting, but I take it with a grain of salt because you have so many talking heads out there every year. It's the same talk track. This is the doom and gloom year. Right. And they've been wrong now for almost about three years. So <laughs> Actually, they've been wrong point, since 2009, buddy. <laughs> Well, but, you know, especially in the last, couple, the last couple of years especially, they've just been preaching doom and gloom to us continuously, and yet the markets keep going higher. So it's funny. Even some of the shorts have kind of mellowed a bit. You know, they're not trying to guess the top anymore because this market's just been so unpredictable. Yep. But I think, you know, as far as a theme right now, I, I shared this with you before the show. In my mind, to me, 2022 is going to be about value and protection. You know, I don't think we're going to see growth the way that we've been used to seeing it. I mean, it's not to say it can't happen, but we're overextended right now. And at any given point, you know, things could change. And again, what's making me a little nervous about saying I'm going to be completely into growth is this inflation problem that's kind of looming out there. And we've got a midterm election coming up in the next year. So it's going to be, a, I think, an interesting year overall, because I think most people are just tired that it's been two years and we still haven't have a solution yet on how this economy is going to kind of turn itself around. Yeah, and I think one of the interesting parts for me is how we've been juicing the economy with this cheap, easy money, and all of a sudden it's like, well, we have to raise it for inflation. And just to bring that inflation discussion home, I have in my hand a nice glass of Raising Cane's iced tea. I went out to lunch today and grabbed uh, you know three little pieces of chicken strips and french fries and a drink, which normally, um, back in January of 2021, uh, 2020, it was $8 even. I remember it because it's just how often you get an even number for your bill. Uh, today it was nine dollars and sixty cents. So I'm thinking, well, that's a twenty percent increase in a little under two years. You know that no inflation, though, guys, no inflation whatsoever in our marketplace. So yeah, I think that that is definitely the big one for me. And you know, I like it, Larry, because 
when you have inflation, to me, it presents obstacles for the market going forward. And again, all the, the doomsayers that it's going to, you know, a 50% market crash. I actually am one of those people. I just don't know when it's going to happen. It will happen because you can't right. keep doing this with inflation and all the uh, interest rate products. But, you know, at some point it's going to end up tanking and hopefully I will be there. Hopefully you'll be there short as well. But um, not right now. Yeah, I, I think it's about really to me coming into 2022 and i've said this you've heard me say this many times it's about education appreciates possessions depreciate the uneducated are going to feel a lot of pain going into the new year because the big difference between especially students here at the academy we teach them to learn how to time this market many people spend way too much time in the markets and what they're going to wind up doing is exactly like they did before only there's a whole new crop of traders that never went through 2000, 2008, their whole world has been bullish. Yeah. And they'll have no clue what to do, especially when the markets go sideways and eventually down. And I think that we're gonna see that sooner than later, only because, let's face it, if they don't handle inflation, right, and keep pumping money into the money supply, that's gonna keep inflating the money, which is gonna devalue our buying power even further enough to the point where, where they're gonna keep doing, cutting us checks to make up for cost of living right now. It's just, there's gonna be a point where they just can't cover this anymore and we're gonna to start to see, you know, the markets react to it. And I think, you know, Powell's come out and said, which makes sense, they're gonna to have to do some increases in interest rates next year. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any surprise in that. The question becomes, what if that doesn't help? What right. if that doesn't help? And then we're back in the green spanner again. What are they gonna do? Raise interest rates every month, every other month again to try to stab things off. So it, it, it's very interesting. And especially if you go out and see some of the things on YouTube right now, you know, you've got Dilo out there and you've got a couple of people just really talking about dent what's going to happen in the new year. And, you know, for me, it's very interesting. And, and I, I have this new quote for the year. So I'll share it with, with your viewers. And I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget it. I think most of the education and stuff that's going to happen in 2022, it's simply going to be money that people are out there selling you a dream and not a skill. Mm -hmm. So I'm seeing more and more people out there right now trying to sell you on this dream of how to get in front of something that can be massive but at the same time, they're not really teaching you anything. No. And so I think people are trying to buy into a dream out of fear. And, you know, you have done an amazing job of really educating people on the right and wrong of crypto. But, you know, this could be dangerous for some who don't know when to get in, when to get out. And I think it's important, you know, that we have to be ahead of this and be very smart about what's going on. And something that's been said to me for years is trade what you see, not what you think. Because the news is all over the place and you can't listen to it. You've got to trade. So we teach our students with core strategy right. to know where we believe there's a higher probability of price turning. Well, I, you, I like your quote, but I'm going to one-up you with my quote. You can't see this one, but I, I just pulled this up because to me it's the best quote. And I think it sets the stage for a bull market. Um, if you look back to 2009, we've been really the most unrelentless or the most relentless bull market I have ever seen in my trading history, which is over 25 years. Here's a quote that I like, guys, and it's basically, oops, that's not John O'Donnell. I don't know why I did that. Here is um, Mike Tyson, and you can see there's obviously somebody just knocked the F out on the floor, and it says, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. And I think that what is special about this quote, at least how it relates to us in trading, is right now everyone's bullish. Everyone's got a long bias. And until this market turns, it will remain bullish. But if that thing turns, you know, if you're not prepared, it's like getting that punch, you know, getting punched in the mouth. And it's like getting hit by Tyson, especially how quickly these things can turn. So um, I think all of us, we've been talking about plans, we've been talking about strategies for it, but it just hasn't surfaced the need to implement those strategies yet. And of course, Larry does a lot with options and trading in that space. And you can be looking at futures, et cetera. But um, as Lisa says, read the charts, not the news. And at this point, the charts are telling us still stay strong, still stay long. Um, you know, Santa Claus rally looks like it's going to be in effect for those of you who uh, voted on my Santa Claus rally poll, which is starting. The, it's the last five days of December and the first two days of January off to a decent start. But um, hopefully you guys will be around on this show when I actually do the uh, pull the trigger and start building a big short position as this market tanks. But it's just not the time, you know, and, and I don't know if it's going to happen in 2022. I, I do think it will. Uh, probably the, the second half of 2022, I think, will be when we really start to see some pain in the marketplace. Right. And I think the other thing we have to understand right now is that, you know, I keep looking at 
things as they are right now. And it was funny because I don't know how or when it happened, but an interview came across from Jeff Bezos back in 2009, him looking at everybody saying, I don't understand this. You know, my business has never been better. My stock is really, really cheap right now. And, and it comes back to something that I remember that Ben Graham, who once said, which is sometimes the company is fine. It's the stock that's broken. Mm -hmm. And I think what's going to be very important into this next year, especially next year, maybe two years, is that all of a sudden we get into corrections. Are you going to be in a position to take advantage of good stocks? Because it's like the old saying, right, Merlin? All you know, in, in low tide is when all those boats basically you start to see the crap that's under the water, right? When three yeah. it's low tide. When it's high tide, you know, everybody looks great. And so if it's okay, I thought maybe to entertain, you know, your your uh, guest, I would do a little piece on value investing because I want to show people because it really takes into account what happened around 2008, nine, that this could happen again. And the question are, are you prepared for this? Because if you are, and it was funny, I was watching the big short the other night, you know, they actually had it on Pluto. Anyone who doesn't know Pluto, it's on Roku. It's a free channel. They do movies, TV shows, etc. And so big short was on and I caught toward the end of it. And it was, it was really subtle. But one of the people that were given to Michael Burry, you know, obviously played by Christian Bale in the movie, a lot of crap in his in his scallion fund. At the very end, someone wrote, can you believe it? He's actually buying stocks at the bottom of this nonsense. <laughs> Think about that. Perfect. Right? It is perfect. That's exactly how people need to be thinking. So I'm going to share my screen. Is that okay with you? Yeah, Just kind of walk it. everybody through something. I think could be really cool. Now what I have to do is find my window. Here it is. Give me one sec. And let me know if you can see, I'm gonna bring up my uh, PowerPoint. Can you see the uh, PowerPoint I brought, Merlo? Not yet. I have a blank screen at this point, but okay. it says uh, scroll the mouse, zoom in. Uh, hmm. I wanna make sure I'm on the right screen. Oh, I see black there, cause I now see it over there. Let me just X out of it and try again All right. and see can do this uh, because you know we live in the world of zoom these days we don't really live ah yeah. uh, here it is I see a PowerPoint yeah, yeah I didn't uh, I, right. we could have done it in a zoom but eh, didn't set up that's so. okay here let me know if you can see it now now let me a sec just to bring it back up can you see it now yep there we go got your value yeah. investing framework and you got a, a black box in the upper right hand corner get rid of yeah, that I'm one. moving you out of the way that's Perfect. the show stuff so I don't want to walk through all of you with it's a pretty interesting kind of study uh, and I got really into years ago this whole idea about value investing and understanding, especially after 2008. It was funny. Uh, I recently watched an interview where Buffett was talking about that both Lehman and AIG called him to invest hmm. to save the companies. And he said no. Yeah. <laughs> he realized that there was no value in their companies. And he's not the kind of guy to chase bad money. And so I want to kind of use this as a kind of a guide for some of you. Maybe some of you have seen this. Maybe some of you have not. But I want to kind of give you an example of what to be thinking about when it comes to buying stock. So here we got 1975. These bunch of hippies get together. They've got this concept. Bill Gates was not told IBM was not interested in his ideas. They started Microsoft in 75. And as a result, when you start a company, there's some what we refer to as intrinsic value in a company. So it's starting to make some money. Well, what we can determine is based upon its intrinsic value is what is the actual price a company would be worth if you were to sell it piece by piece. And this was really done a lot back in the 80s, you know, when they were basically buying companies and breaking them up and selling them. But I want you to see how this plays out. So in 1986, Microsoft decided to do an IPO. Now, from the IPO, their market share was about 120 million at the time of the IPO. Now watch this. This is where now a company goes public, it starts to branch and break off. The blue line remains as the actual true growth of Microsoft. So as you can see here, the green line is representing the stock price that people in the open free markets are trading around. You can see that there are times where we basically will see price above, price below its true value, and then all of a sudden there was this big rally up. 
Now, what I want to share here in the year 2000 of the tech bubble, here we had Microsoft, a $120 million company in 1986. And because of the inflated stock price up to $60 right before the bubble, they became a $600 billion with a B market valuation company. But here's the important thing to understand. As I was saying, if I were to really look at Microsoft in the year 2000, their value is only 200 billion. So they were overvalued because of what people were willing to buy the stock up for. Okay, so the blue line is not book value, it's intrinsic value. Okay, so book value and intrinsic value can be slightly different. There's calculations and different ways that people calculate intrinsic value. But the important thing to understand, as you can see here, was the markets were out of whack. Now, here's the problem. A guy like Warren Buffett, a value investor, is not buying Microsoft at $60 a share. In fact, he would run away from it at this point. I want to show you what happened after the tech bubble. So notice now, a very fascinating thing happens right here. The market price drops for the first time since it went to an IPO, other than the initial kind of noise here, it's now cheaper than what it truly should be worth. So here's the thing. For years after 2000 notice, you could have bought Microsoft stock at a great valuation compared to what it truly should be worth. So for here, I just want everyone to understand right now that you can see when you understand this, that this makes a lot more sense. How many of us would have loved to have bought Microsoft stock today back then for $15 a share, all right? Mm -hmm. Think about that, right? I could have owned Microsoft at $15 a share in the year 2009, where Burry's investor was laughing at him saying, who would do something crazy like this? Well, look at the valuation. Simply in nine years, it went from 600 billion down to 106 billion after the crash. But here's what I want you all to focus on. The company was worth $313 billion. Now, this is the time I get excited. You might have heard Warren Buffett say this. Be greedy when others are fearful. Be fearful when others are greedy. So at this point in time, you could have bought a company that's at a third of its true valuation because the way the markets reacted. Now watch what happened next. Let me, let me ask you real quick. We'll, yep. we'll check out the next part. But what you know, when you talk about its its true valuation, what it's really worth, you know, it's yep. kind of subjective because there's got to be a, a specific set of metrics that you're looking at. You know, I know we'll talk as we progress here, yep. <laughs> going into 2022. You know, we are at all time highs in the market. Pretty much everything's at all time highs, and yet you're still saying I can find value out there. So what are some of those? Yes qualifiers or metrics that you're looking at to help justify paying such a maybe a lofty price in this case with, with Microsoft it was a cheap price but you know who's to say it wasn't going to go down to 10 bucks or five bucks or two bucks absolutely and that's the thing I'm going to get to you're absolutely right what I'm going to do is share some metrics now there's more to it this is what I'm sharing but I want to kind of introduce people to this idea that there's a way to be able to invest right now if you know when the right time is so what I was going to show you next was after 2009, boom, right there, we saw price cross intrinsic value again. And in 2017, we saw Microsoft go from about 106 billion in 09 to 500 billion, almost as much as it was back in 2000 at the tech bubble, right? Mm -hmm. But again, what we can probably ascertain from this is that its market value is much higher than its actual intrinsic value. And what this, from a standpoint of just education, is telling me, I will be overpaying for this stock. Now, you're right. Here we can talk about what you're thinking, Merlin, and I'll go into a little more detail. So it pretty much helps by understanding the fun fundamentals of a company. Again, we're not talking about trading. We're talking about investing. You want to be an owner of a company. You're not looking to sell this in a year or two. In fact, the average hold time of a value investing stock as a minimum would be three years. So if you're thinking about doing this, you'd have to be willing to hold a stock at least for three years for price, like in this example, to get back to 
what we would consider fair value. And so I want you to see here that at the time most people are entering their trades, many don't even understand this, right? They're so caught up in the euphoria, the FOMO, all these different reasons of why we have to buy that we're not looking at the most important factor when it comes to investing, which is I'm going to look back five to 10 years as a minimum. I want to know what this company has been able to do, and I want to make sure it has some utility and usefulness in the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's look at Kodak, right? Kodak is gone. We will never have to see that. And the reason they're gone is they could have gone digital back in the 70s. And they thought Kodachrome would never go away. So a lot of times businesses either become distinct or they become extinct, you know, and now we have this next level of companies. And this is what people, when they think about investing for the longer term, should be thinking about. Number one, what is the future going to look like? Okay, what is a company's future estimated extrinsic value? And that's the most important thing. There's a way to calculate in the next five years or so or 10 years what we can predict the price of a company to be into the future. And then what we have to understand here is it will help us gauge future opportunity for growth. Because as I'm an investor or owner of a company, the most important thing to me is, is the company giving me back value for my investment? And so the way that we can reduce the risk in our investment is basically going ahead and finding what we consider high confidence in what's going to happen in the future. So here's the question you've been looking for, Merlin, okay? This idea, okay, that if a company has basically grown in the past less than 10%, it's a poor company. You want to find a company that's had the ability over five to 10 years to sustain growth of 10 to 15 percent as a good company. If they're growing 15 to 20 percent, it's really good. And if they're over 20 percent year over year growth, they're excellent. And so some of the investment guidelines that you'd be looking for, and here's just two of them, you'd want to see that this company has the ability every year to grow 10 percent or more year over year while at the same time keeping their debt reasonable. And this is a problem for a lot of companies because the only way that they can continue to stay in business is they've got to buy their way out of it. And a lot of companies right now have really high equity to debt ratio, which means that their debt could be $5 for every dollar that they're generating. Mm -hmm. And so when we look at this, the biggest influencing factor on what future price would be is what is the company truly going to be worth? So in a perfect world, we'd love to see this company rally and keep going higher and higher in their intrinsic value. If it continues to grow at a decent clip, great. What we don't want to see is a company go into phase C and not know that this is a company on the decline and not really as strong as it used to be. And so this helps us by looking at their intrinsic value to determine how a company is able to staff off competition. And so you have a company that has a great what we call moat. You know, they're able like a, like a castle to have a competitive advantage that's like a moat around their company, which makes it very difficult for people to come in and compete against you or makes it very difficult for people to price against you. You can do things to kind of take control of a market. And so the best companies out there, the ones that really protect themselves from their competition, that's how they can sustain that type of growth. And so therefore, what we're looking for is that lowest level of risk that offers the highest return. So it's no different than what we learn in any type of trading or investing, buy low, sell high. And so again, if we can see this future intrinsic value growing, okay, and let's say we're right there at that moment of entry, Okay, what we don't want to do is look to be buying stock that's overvalued today compared to what the company should be valued at. Instead, we want to do scenario B. We want to find those companies that are undervalued, that have the potential to rally back or at least get back to fair value of what it should be worth. Now, how do you do that? Well, Ben Graham taught Buffett this concept called a margin of safety. What he looks for on top of everything else is, I want to find a stock that's trading at a 20 to 50% discount of its actual value. So think about it. Number one, you've got a stock that's incredibly undervalued and you can get a discount upon that. 
And so when you look at these things right now and how these outcomes can play out, even if the intrinsic value goes down a tad, because you were able to buy the stock at a discount, it allowed you to go ahead and still make money over the long term. And so notice that B will often offer the greatest valuation. And even if we see declines like we saw in 2008, we will not see price go below what we paid for it unless, of course, it's Bear Stearns or Lehman Brothers, which is collapsing and about to go out of business. So just real quickly, when you talk about intrinsic value right now, it's just looking at a stock at terms of ownership with an underlying value that doesn't depend upon the share price. Because again, what we're looking for are those opportunities where the company is great, they're doing really well, they're healthy, but the stock is out of favor right now. And that value is intrinsic value and we have to effectively estimate a margin of safety to allow us to be able to go ahead and take advantage of it. So what Warren Buffett actually came out and said once was intrinsic value can be defined simply it is the discounted value of the cash that can be taken out of a business during its remaining life. So Buffett is all about cash flow. As many of you know, he's always looking to buy depressed valued businesses that are still very, very strong. And so it's simply this, and I know IV can confuse some of you that are option traders, it's not implied volatility. Intrinsic value is simply that net present value of all their future cash flows and possible sources of how they're gonna retain their competitive edge with dividends or some type of return on investment, and then basically may have the possibility of getting some additional appreciation of capital. And the way that we calculate it is by using past performance as an estimation. Now, part of this is science and part of it is kind of art. There's no guarantee that you're gonna get it on the nail on the head. We're just looking for an area of opportunity where we can see something being done. So in closing this section, and I'm gonna give you guys a real interesting example of this. Number one, if you're interested in doing value investing, which I really encourage everybody to consider, because imagine having another scenario like 2009 and all the prices are way down, but you don't have a mechanism or means to determine, is the stock crappy intentionally like a Citigroup that deserved to be down there? Or is it like an NVIDIA that was undervalued that actually was three times you know, it's selling for three times less than it should have been selling for. So things to keep in mind, number one, you want to be an owner of the company. You want to make sure that you want to own this company. You've got to be in this stock for at least three years before we start to make decisions of whether it's working or not. Two, you want to own the best companies that continue to grow over time. So you're looking for market leaders that have sustainable growth. Three, they've got to be able to take on their competition, continue to have competitive advantages, which are called economic moats. And finally, finding a stock that allows you to buy it even on a further discount, which is referred to as margin of safety. Correct, Rob. You know, that's the whole thing about it, assuming the company's reporting correct information. But you know what? They can or can't. If they do get caught, guess what? Uh, there is a scanner, Pepe. I'm going to talk about that in a moment. But I want to give you guys an actual an example. And Merlin remembers this very, very well. So, oh, I'm leaving. <laughs> no, no, this is good because this will talk about exactly what was afforded at this time. So it was kind of interesting. I flew to Atlanta and I met with a guy that really understood the value investing piece. And I invested in myself. I flew down there for three days. I paid him. I was there. But I came away with all those questions that I finally wanted answered. And Merlin and I were sitting in the studio about to do power trading radio, and he was talking to me back then about his anti-Kramer portfolio. Yeah. You know, uh, he told me, I said, well, what's that? You know, every time that you buy, that he says buy, I sold. And I said, well, I just came from Atlanta. I found this first stock. What if you and I just started to do a value investing PTR type educational portfolio? And the first one was this. And the reason why NVIDIA got on my radar, there was an interview with the chairman of NVIDIA at the time in late 2015. He went on air and said, we are committed to be the premier chip maker of driveless cars. Now, right there in 2015, which in the rearview mirror now is going to be, wow, seven years ago, right? Definitely six. All of a sudden back then, people were not there yet. 
And this happens throughout history. Think about the first person that had to get into an airplane and said, yeah, I'm going to get into that thing filled with gas and be in the air. Yeah, it's safe. And now nobody would think twice unless they have a true fear of flying. Same thing with the Internet. Same thing Merlin has been talking about with crypto. Well, when that interview happened back on around November 27th, the stock was trading around 3139. Intrinsically, the stock was worth about $93. So right there, I was looking at a stock that should be trading around $93 at 3139. Now here's what happened, right? Boom. I picked the date of January 19th, 2018 intentionally, and I'll explain that in a moment, but you could have bought the stock at 3139 on January 19th of 2018. It was trading at 23011 and you could have made 633% on the stock. Now, Merlin started going around here. You're going to sell it? You're going to sell it? And I'm like, "No. Well, what about here?" No. Again, if I'm treating this as a value investing stock, then I have to be prepared to stay in this for at least three years. Okay, now, the reason I picked that date is to show you something interesting, right? Boom, if you had simply decided back on November 27th to buy 100 shares of Nvidia stock, you would have paid about $3,200. And then here we are almost, right? Almost two and a quarter years later, and that same stock is now up to 198.72 with a 633% profit, all right? So again, this is just showing you the power of things that are out of sync with its true valuation and all of a sudden price takes off. Now, what if you did 1,000 shares? Think about that, right? Not too bad, 31,000 would have turned into about 167,000. Now, the reason I can say this is I'm, it's not anything bragging, this is fact. If you go back and look at prices on these days, this is educational, right? I'm showing you what actually happened. Now, here's why I picked this date in general, right? Many of you know that I'm an options trader, right? Now, going back here, and I want you to see the exact date we were talking about. On November 27, 2015, you could have bought the 30 calls and paid $6.95 a sh for the contract or $695. How many people going back would kick themselves to have that chance to buy NVIDIA, right, at $695 with the right down the road, right? And again, this is 15, two and a half years later, to buy this stock at 30 Correct. This is leaps. Absolutely. Right. This was a leap because this was 2015. And notice you could have bought options all the way out to January of 2018. Pretty cool, right? So now we know how the stock appreciated. How did the option do? Well, notice you could have bought the January 1830 calls at $6.95 and sold them on January. All right. Uh, in the month that expired, the three calls for $199.95. So notice you made about $193 per contract. Again, we can see the price right here in the option chain. So there's no chicanery, as they would say. You like that word, Merlin? Love chicanery. it, chicanery. All right. Now let's just do a quick comparison, right? I could have bought 100 shares in 15 and paid $31.39, or I could have bought one contract that allowed me to control the same number of shares without me committing any money other than buying power. All through this trade, the most I could lose was $695. Now look at the difference here. Your investment would have turned into $19,300, and you would have been up almost 2,900%. Look at what the numbers would have looked like had you done 10 contracts, the equivalent of 1,000 shares, and you would have been closer to about $200,000. Now, why do I bring this up? Because there are opportunities continuously out there that, again, as Merlin said, price is relative. But what if I find something that's undervalued by 25 to 50%, and now who can tell me what else happened with NVIDIA? We had stock splits, didn't we? So now imagine you didn't pay 31.39 for the stock, 
you actually paid a fraction of even that. So let's just pretend here. And I'm trying to remember what it split for. There's been so many splits. Merlin. I think it was five for one. Okay. So if it was five to one right now, okay, which means that I could deduct this price by five, okay, it means I'm just going to do my quick calculation here. My 3139 stock per share, I would have bought for $6.28. In what reality, even with a market correction, does anybody believe that NVIDIA stock, unless the company does something stupid and blows itself up, is going to be down at $6 again? Yeah. That's yeah. the betting that we're doing. This is why a Warren Buffett doesn't have to think about selling. He's collecting his dividends if it's dividend bearing. But now I want to show you something that's going to really – Merlin hasn't even seen this. Ready, Merlin? I'll bring it so on. Merle, I got my whiskey check ready. this out. I smiled and Merlin's gonna go, ah, ready? Oh no. NVIDIA's trillion dollar AI opportunity. Oh yeah, I know that. NVIDIA might become a trillion dollar company that you could have gone ahead and bought for less than $40 a share. So these are the kind of things out there, and I'll kind of come back. I've got another segment to do after this, but let's talk about it, Merlin. If you wanna, I'll stop sharing. We can just talk about what we saw here. This is something that I think if the market's correct or we get another crash, I'm going to be all about this and I will know ahead of time which stocks I really, oops, which stocks I'm definitely more interested in wanting to look at in the future. Uh, so, so let me re real quickly read this comment from Tom. He says, uh, was autonomous vehicles the reason NVIDIA shot up? Not necessarily, it wasn't no. exclusively that. Certainly the mining was a big part of it, but there were also some of the best graphics chips out there. So if you're doing any sort of 3D graphics, animation stuff, they were the leaders to be in. I mean, AMD t actually is doing better, but Intel took a big dump. So now you add on to that the layers of complexity. And we actually had this discussion back in, I think, 2016, where you know if you peel off the different layers of the onion, and again, We'll tie all this back to 2022 and 2021 and analysis, but if you look at a good business, they need to have multiple sources of income or, or at least targets for their product. And when the AI piece really started to hit home, which was a few years back, you know, now all of a sudden uh, that was another massive catalyst for their price move. And I, and I have the chart here. Here's here's NVIDIA's chart. I, when Larry was talking about this, this thing was at seven, uh, I think seven bucks or five bucks. I mean, if you do a split adjusted and, and you look at it now, and of course, you know, I'm kicking myself, but I, you know, I'm honest with you guys. You know that there's no way, there's no way in hell that Merlin would have held that from $5 to 340. It, it's an, it's an impossibility because of the way that my brain works. And I think this is what's so important about what Larry's talking about. It's saying we all have different ways that we perceive things. Normally, if I'm up 100% on something, I'm, I'm probably going to cash out or at least sell most of it and trail the second half. Larry's got a different perspective on it. And in his year, his timeline might be three, four, five years. Very different um, for each of us. you know. So I know some of you are like, there's no way he would have held that. Well, yeah, there, there are positions that he would have. I, I probably wouldn't have. And some of you would, some of you wouldn't. But I, I think that's the important part. There's three things that I hate in, in trading and investing, which is should have, could have, would have. But you know, this is one of those situations where... Larry was in my face telling me this thing when it was at 38 bucks. I'm like, okay, yeah, fine, great. Um, you know, my fault for not listening to it, but of course I'm a skeptic with everyone's advice. <laughs> right. Well, I want to answer a couple of questions. Yeah, do it. Uh, absolutely, true and, absolutely true in the fact that when I first saw this, it was all about the driveless cars. I wasn't anticipating this rapid gear up. Merlin was the one who came and said, NVIDIA has now become the premier chip maker. Man, did you get lucky. And again, when I get into these stocks, you know, and they do, mo most of the value investing stocks that I've seen tend to do three digits. So if you're into like 100 to 1,000 percent, a value investing stock, if hit at the right time, does very, very well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so that's one thing to consider. Uh, you can't do these on ETFs because ETFs just are basically a basket of stocks. It's not really its own entity. So, but... I mean, hold on. Let's let's step back there. You can let me let me take that. You can use these strategies on ETFs. Like obviously, there's might be a micro sector ETF. Like right now, one of the hot ones we looked at in the Crypto Investor Live program is a DeFi ETF, and that may have explosive growth potential. But this is one of the reasons we talk about going into into ETFs is to minimize risk by by eliminating diversifiable risk. What Larry's saying is literally look at the opposite of the spectrum and saying. I'm okay to take on whatever risk this single security holds because I've done my analysis and I'm purchasing it as a at a discount because it's a value play. 
So, you know, um, you're probably not going to get the the thousand X move out of an ETF. It's just there's too many securities in there to balance right. it out. But single stock, you can get that. So it's it's a constant trade off of risk versus reward. Right. And, and the other thing to keep in mind right now, just before we leave this topic. So those some people have been asking, I can see in the thing, what about this intrinsic value? And someone mentioned it earlier about a year ago, Bashir Chai and I put our heads together. Uh, he wanted to write a course. I wanted to write a course. So I just helped him with his. I think it's a great course. If you have not taken it yet, maybe some of you have and you're interested in this. We built an entire kind of checklist, a worksheet where you can plug in numbers, where to get those numbers. So it is easier for you as well as scanning for those opportunities. So someone asked if there was a scanner. Yes. In that particular course, uh, it's available. So if you're interested, you know, Learn a little bit more about Bashir's uh, course. It's called uh, Priming Your Portfolio. I think it's an excellent course. He does a great job with it and will definitely give you some opportunity to learn about these type of things. I love them. Uh, what's my crypto version of NVIDIA? You know, that's more Merlin's, that's more Merlin's camp. Uh, I, I kind of defer that to him. He's kind of my Warren Buffett of, of crypto. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, who knows what the, the crypto version of it will be. There's plenty. But I want to make sure, I want to take a step back and, you know, look at with this, with what Larry was explaining to everyone. I think it's important going into 2022 for a couple of reasons. Number one, you, know, you look at this market and, and here's the, the visual of the market for everybody. You can see here's your S&P. This is a monthly chart. Uh, I've got some lines drawn. Let me get rid of some of that stuff. But, you know, all time highs yet again. You know, we're, we're just ripping all time highs. A lot of you are probably thinking, well, there's not much value, right? There's not much value here because everything's so overpriced. And, and that's not necessarily true. Uh, I think that maybe correct me if I'm wrong here, Larry, but from my perspective, there is value, but it's much harder to find, right? When a market's down 80% or 50%, it's like, okay, it's shooting fish in a barrel. Which one do I want? When everything's at all-time highs like this, you know, it's a bit more challenging because you have to, you know, just dig deeper through the fundamentals and, and look for all these different metrics, which are are high compared to its peers. So how do you find that? We're going into 2022, how do we apply value investing? Again, a lot of this has to do with understanding how to scan for it, which I spent a lot of time figuring out how to do. Uh, and really, at this point in time, you know, I'll give you one that just got on my radar. It's kind of pricey, but again, options could be used if you want to bring up, because I can't see your screen, EPAM, EPAM. Okay. Right? EFAM, okay. Great fundamentals, great potential for growth right now. When I was looking at it, it was getting in around 593.51. Okay, this was back on December 7th is when this got on the radar for our kind of educational portfolio. Who the hell is uh, is is this make is this the the company that makes the little spray uh, spray butter for my pans? I mean what the hell is Pam doing? Epam. I mean, how do you Pam? What 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 did it close at today? I'm just curious. What did uh, it you're close at 677.84. All right. 677 what was it? 84. All right. So as of today since December 7th this stock is up 14%. So you see that when you catch this at the right time, it's not just only the fundamentals. I also use core strategy with it. So when I can find an area where I expect price to bounce on a retest, even better. But I'm looking for an area of price that makes sense. That's mm -hmm. kind of the key of this. But no, I mean, literally in November and December, I found three so far and they take a little time to gear up. I'll never forget uh, Merlin back in 17 kept giving me a lot of crap about trade desk, TTD. Larry, it's not moving off of 50. Larry, it's not moving off of 50. Okay, that one right now, since we went in on June 1st, is up 1,647%. Hmm. So you got to give these things time to play out. They're not going to be as sexy as crypto for sure. But if it's something you want to put into your portfolio where you anticipate some growth, you don't have the stress. I'm not biting my nails like Merlin is on crypto every day. <laughs> now, we talk about this a lot. Merlin will say, hey, look at this big rally. And I'll look at him and go, yeah, look at that big drop. Yeah. <laughs> he has bigger rallies than I do, but I have lesser drops than he does. So, well, you know, hold on. Let's, I've got some charts up here. Here's Skyworks, you know. I mean, again, in Skyworks in, in January of 2020, was it 128? I mean, you had all the way down to 68. And right now it had a peak of... 
203 and it dropped all the way to 141. So you do have some significant pullbacks in here. I mean, the trade desk went from 97 bucks all the way down to 45. That's a 50% drop. Right. But it's not at its intrinsic value. Right. So if we look at Skyworks, ready? Skyworks yep. was at $78 back on May 13th when you and I looked at that. Right now, and I don't know what closed at today, but as of when I looked at it last Friday at 153.42, it's up 97%. Yep. Right. So, so again, it's a longer term outlook here, not necessarily going for those quick wins and losses. And I think that that's going to be a flight to safety right now in New Year's that people want to get into things. I'm not talking about speculating and trading. We're talking about investing. Mm -hmm. You know, these could be little things to put into retirement and leave alone for a while and see how they tend to work out. And you're right. I, I, I'm not looking for 100 trades. If anything, I can find two or three in a year. I'm OK with that. Yeah. You don't have to have a huge account with this, you know, in terms of numbers of trades. You know, as we roll into 2022, what sort of things are you looking for this year? I mean, obviously, uh, we have our biases. Whether you say you do or you don't, you're, you're lying. You're, you're Obviously, there is some bias there that people have and you're expecting certain things to happen. Um, obviously, we start off. We're ending on a high note, um, a lot of expectation of what's going to happen in January. What are some things you're looking for for 2022? Well, again, I'm looking to see a lot of different things. You know, the things that worry me right now is even beyond political right now, what's going on on the world stage? You know, what's going to happen with Ukraine? What's going to happen with Taiwan? What's, you know, there's a lot of things brewing out there right now. We have inflation, like I've been talking about. So really what I'm going to tend to focus on are which sectors are going to benefit on different scenarios. And you and I have done that for a long time, you yeah. know. And one of the things I really love, honestly, I don't know how many of the people out there have done this. So if you do and you want to chime in, that would be great. I'm just curious. Sorry, I'm just looking to so I can see the chat again. I want to bring back up uh, YouTube. Sorry, there I am. Good. So I can see the chat is, uh, you know, sector rotation. Yeah. And one of the things that I think Scott McCormick has done a great job along with the education team is building a brand new stock program that's focused on looking at the broader markets and how we can use that for any of the other type of trading we're going to do. So a lot of it's focused on which sectors are outperforming. We talk about sector rotation. That's going to become key right now, especially if you don't understand how the markets tend to cycle. You know, in different years, you might be in something that's about to go into more of a depressive state or maybe the sector itself has been depreciating and went from being very undervalued to very overvalued right now. And it's not performing better than the S&P anymore. Uh, the other thing is currencies. Mm -hmm. I'm really looking to some currencies and it could be stable that you've been talking about or it could be just regular foreign currency that I'm being very real to believe that just because the markets are going to go lower, don't presume gold and dollar are the place to put your money. If they're not rallying and they're going sideways or down, then you're just basically taking money you can't use to put it in something else that won't generate money as well. So this is why, you know, for a lot of students, being well educated in futures so they can take advantage of currencies or forex understanding crypto right now i mean you've really got me into crypto he'll tell you i fought it like tooth and nail for years <laughs> uh, but i was really not regretting but a little bummed that i didn't i didn't go sooner but i didn't understand it you know and uh around 17 i did and i started to play in that arena you know oh thank you someone's saying i'm looking a bit more svelte <laughs> <laughs> Cam camera angles, my man. Camera angles. We call them Svelte Lana. <laughs> hey, you, you know, remember that old workout routine in the in the in the eighties, Merlin called Body by Jake. I do. This is Body by Neglect. <laughs> <laughs> there you oh, go. Larry, that's his 2020 resolution. He's going to take better care of himself, aren't you, Larry? I have been. Yeah, you, you know? have. Back but running I, again. I would, I would just say at this point, everybody. You got to have a plan. Do not go into 2022 without a plan. How you're going to manage, what are your rules, uh, what things that you want to primarily focus on. And for me, again, you know, I know we're running out of time. I don't know how much time we have left. I want to. Whatever you want. I got nothing to do. 
All right. So you guys want to see one more thing that I talked about in a holiday party yesterday? It was kind of interesting. And I think this could play out for other things as well. I'm just uh, waiting for the chat. You got a 30 okay. second delay on the chat. So I'm in just because I wasn't okay. at the holiday party. Unfortunately, I was driving. So <laughs> funny. <laughs> His body by bud. That's right. <laughs> All right, so let's go ahead here. I'm going to share one more time. Bring back up that slide deck. Hold on a sec. Now I just got to find it. Wait, wait for this to load. There it is. Okay. So let me grab it. Bring it back over again. Where am I? Almost there. I saw, yeah, I'm seeing it, but I'm not. I'm seeing us. Where it is? Here it is. Okay. Boom. All right. So let me just blow this up again. So while, while this is loading, I'll just kind of there talk to everybody about now we what have happened. It. Yep. Let me go ahead and just uh, switch this. So yesterday we had our holiday party. It was in the last two days in Southern California, in both Irvine and Woodland Hills. It was so great to see so many students in Maryland. It was like the parking lot was so packed. It was awesome. Oh, the good old uh, days. One of the things that I would kind of want to show everybody real quickly when I talk about protection, again, what I'm kind of sharing is it can be done without stock, but if you own stock right now and you're worried, you don't want to give up the stock, this can be done in a retirement account. That we looked at something yesterday, right before earnings, and I think this could be done regardless of earnings or not. That CalMain was the only stock yesterday that was announcing earnings <laughs> after the market closed. No other stock announced but CalMain Foods. And so what we talked about was let's say you bought this stock. Okay, you originally bought it here, maybe on this first retest back to the demand area here, and you decided to buy the 100 shares, and you're long, and you think, this is great, it could rally up to here. Well, guess what? Yesterday, announcement of earnings came, and what I said to students were, there's one of two things you can do. You can just get out of the stock, right, because you don't want to get caught in the the earnings play and all of a sudden see a winner become a loser, or you can do something that I love to do with options, which is buy protection. And if you think about it, it's no different than what you do every single month when it comes to your insurances, right? There's some of you out there right now that have to have car insurance, you have home insurance or renter's insurance or health insurance, but so many people fail to learn about portfolio insurance. And so what we did, it was pretty fascinating, Merlin. This is what the chart looked like right when the market closed before the earnings announcement. You with me? Yep. So one of two things could have happened. We either could have rallied back up here to our supply zone where there was a good amount of potential unfilled sell orders. It looks like it was the actual zone that started the sell off. One little retest came back down again, or it was going to collapse. Now, let's say that I wanted to protect myself from the collapse. Now, I'm going to show you exactly what happened when the announcement hit on an hour chart. Boom. How many people do you think out there felt real happy waking up this morning knowing, okay, knowing that price fell off the cliff? You see that? <laughs> and where did it happen to stop? At the demand zone. So I actually talked through this with the classes yesterday, and we basically said, okay, before the close, we could have put on some puts for every 100 shares that we owned. And right now we can say, okay, before the close, we could have bought the January 7th 40 puts and we would have paid $2.75 or $275 a contract. Now, when you think about it, that's not really out of the realm of what you pay for the month for car insurance, right? So imagine that you put up the 275. Now, by the way, had the price rallied through here, Fine, you would have lost the 275, which all of us tend to do anyway with insurance every month. By the way, I've shared this with Merlin. Some of you heard me say this yesterday. The greatest scam of the insurance companies was the year 2020. Why? Because all of us paid car insurance and nobody drove anywhere. <laughs> Yet we felt compelled to pay it every month, didn't we, Merlin? Yep. Right? right. And so these guys were collecting money fist over fist that year. Well, insurance companies protect themselves from risk. Well, so did we. If the price fell and you saw this, look how it came right down and came into our demand this morning. It was amazing. Well, had you bought the puts on the open, you would have bought the 275 puts back for 555, made $280 profit per contract, and you could have made 102% overnight. 
Anybody okay with that? Merlin, you okay with that? Bring it on. I'll do it all day long. Right. And then guess what? Because of what we intended and the zone was correct, you could have done one of two things. You could have decided to go long the call if you wanted to. Now, I checked it. This at 1130. I hadn't checked to see what it actually closed at today. But you could have bought at the open when price got down in here. You could have bought it at four dollars. And at 1130 Pacific time today, the option was worth 430. So you were up 30 bucks and you would have made seven and a half percent in one day. Or some of you who own the stock might have said, great, I'm going to take the profit from my puts. I'm going to buy more shares. And now instead of having 100 shares, I now have 108 shares. And when price gets up to my supply zone, I could sell the stock or I could sell calls as a covered call strategy and collect premium while I wait. So the point of bringing all this up is to say, don't be afraid of being willing to put out some protection if the charts are showing you that. Now, right now at an all time high, I'm not gonna be the one to try to call a top. But when I start to see the markets go sideways and all of a sudden price isn't making new higher highs anymore and we're going sideways for a moment, that's where I start to go into planning mode. And someone asked in the chat, is OTA going to show us how to trade a bear market? We do all the time. You know what to do. If the markets went down, you can short stock. You can go long puts. I can basically sell futures contracts. So people know how to do this. It's just they don't know how to react and emotionally be OK in a bear market. So these things are going to be out there and there's no reason that you don't want to learn a skill that would allow you to basically not have to sell your stock in case you think this can go even higher. So Merlin, that's what I wanted to show everybody because like I said, I started the show off today saying my year is going to be based upon protection and value. That's kind of where I'm seeing things heading into the new year and a lot of my plays, if they basically come out to be that, is what I'm going to look to do in the long run. Protection and value, I love it. Um, I'm doing a lot of, va not necessarily value, because I don't look like for the, the deep discounts, I don't care to look at fundamentals. That's just, uh, it's outside of my purvey of expertise. But certainly, um, I'm striving for 2022 to be more consistent. Certainly, uh, you know, with my option strategies, I share with the people here, the real simple option strategy, be more consistent with that uh, and build some more structure around my crypto. So that kind of, those are my two goals out there. Other than that, everything's staying the same. You know, if they, it ain't broke, don't fix it. So I'll stay... Stay with it. Um, I saw a comment in here. What it said? Uh, believable direction says, "Can you sell options against a long position?" Yes, absolutely. Yes, you can. And a great thing absolutely. to do to help generate some extra income streams from a position that you're already long on. Why not? Right. Absolutely. In fact, what I showed yesterday to some of the students that were in the holiday party was I gave them a compelling argument why buy stock for a dividend. Yeah. Right? I don't want to own the stock just to have a dividend. I'd rather use options and collect the same amount I would make without having to hold the stock indefinitely just to collect, you know, a 5% dividend from a company. Yep. So there's a lot of different things that you can be getting yourself educated in right now. You know, I'm constantly asking Merlin questions in the crypto world. And I know a lot of you who are in his crypto uh, investor live program, you guys have that great opportunity like I do to ask him questions. So. <laughs> Best thing I would do in advice is just say when the markets get more volatile and you're unsure, cut back on your position size. If you're not sure, don't trade. No one's telling you you have to. The market will be open and you can decide to trade when everything looks great for you. Oh, Larry, um, as far as your courses, um, I know that you're filling in as we've obviously downsized quite a bit from uh, previous years with instructors and hopefully we'll get back up to uh, those those upper echelons of what we used to be. Uh, what typical class schedules like I know you're doing XLTs you're doing the options class but what's your teaching schedule like pretty much it's just that I mean I have been so busy right now with all the stuff going on that I have not been really in the classroom as much I'm I tend to do more online if I'm gonna do something so periodically I'm in an online class and uh, did that one a couple of weeks ago and also I'm doing continuing to do XLTs in the month I've also started to do the new trade plan essentials class and I, I really highly recommend OK, that uh, the trade plan class is something I would really look into. It's online if you want to uh, take it with me or you can some of your centers are doing them on location. But get in there and do that. Don't put this off into a new year, especially when it might be uncertain and not have a plan or something that you feel very comfortable with. So I think that's something that I will continue to do at least once a month. 
uh, in the future is going to be doing that. And I'm also doing a Saturday clubhouse that you're aware of for our, our mastermind students. I'm going in there and kind of teaching them my rules and best practices around weekly options. Um, you got a tough customer in here. Tom says, hey, plug Larry's options two class in Irvine. So, uh, Larry, I'll probably let you do that because I know you're a you're a, you're a tough customer when it comes to content, but I have a feeling you really enjoyed Larry's Options 2 class. And, you know, this is one of the things I, I think you all have to appreciate and, and be willing to accept at Online Trading Academy is let's say you come and you decide to take, a, I don't know, we'll just say strategic investor course and you take it with me, but you're like, oh, well, I didn't really like Merlin. His personality is a bit abrasive, blah, 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 whatever the case may be. You know, you have the ability to go back and take these with other instructors. And while you'll get certain pieces from me, whether you like my personality type or not, you take with another instructor, you gain more. And I think that that's a huge advantage we have over really any other school out there where they hire one instructor to teach a subject matter. You know, learn from multiple people, whether you like their teaching style or not. It's their stories and their experiences. And sometimes the strategies they sprinkle on top that helps us. Uh, refine what we're trying to achieve and make it even better. So get in there and, and um, learn from everybody. Let's see, the one one, um, Rob, I, he says, is Verizon a value play? We probably have to, that would take way too much yeah. time. To, we have to go through all yeah. the fundamentals on that one. Maybe Larry and I will look at that one and do a special show in January on that one. And then Margaret says, Larry, when you uh, with your dividends on those IV stocks, do you reinvest it? Uh, yeah, I mean, basically at this point, uh, I have everything under reinvestment. So yes, uh, if it's a dividend bearing stock, some of them are not dividend bearing. Right. So the ones that are, they're always set for reinvestment. Yeah. All right. Well, Larry, thank you so much. I know it's been uh, like a year since I've had you on and uh, we've gone officially well over past our normal time. So thank you for coming on. I'm, I'm going to bug you to get you on more frequently in 2022. Deal with it. Yeah. No, I, lo I love to do it. It's like it's, the problem is Based on the time of the show, you know, there's always some meetings going around, but uh, I just want to say to anybody who's listening, our centers are open. You know, there are classes now going back on in centers live. Feel free to talk to your centers. You know, we're holding classes now. You have the ability to do it on demand, connected, online, and in the center. So make this the year that you guys really go ahead and re-engage right now. Uh, you know, I, I know I haven't had enough time to really bash on Merlin enough. I'll have to work on that in the new year as well. <laughs> I'll be I'll be ready and waiting for it, Larry. <laughs> <laughs> hey, thank you very much. I hope you have a fantastic new year, and I'll see you in 2022, my friend. Yep. Happy New Year, everybody. Have a great new year. Be safe, Merlin. We got a Benny night coming. Oh, don't tempt me with a good time. I'll see you at Benny Hanna, Larry. Take care. <laughs> you got it, guys. Bye, everybody. Guys, that was Larry Jacobson, Online Trading Academy. Um, you know, there's many of you who've taken classes with Larry. You know that not only is he a great teacher, but his first and foremost intent is to make sure that everybody gets it and improve your understanding about whatever asset class. Just a great guy. Um, always a pleasure having Larry on the program. So sorry it took so long, but hey, we finally got him. Um, as far as what's happening in the new year, you know, personally, I used to do a show every year for Online Trading Academy saying, here's what you can expect in 2022 or the next year that's coming up. And bottom line is, whatever happens, happens. You know, I think that's the true hallmark of a good trader or investor saying, hey, throw at me what you can. I'll deal with it when it comes. And of course, I think that it does allow us to have a little bit of a plan in place. Like if we start to see high inflation, I'm looking to do this. Or, you know, if, if I see the markets correct, I'm looking to do this and at least have the basis of a plan in place. And I think part of that is, um, and that's part of the joy for me anyway, is is starting to strategize. I mean, if you talk to some, you know, diehard military guys, they're, they love, they're loving combat and the strategies that go with each specific situation and the tools needed to address that moment of combat uh, or an engineer type. And we got some engineers here. You know, you're looking at different strategies and tactics for different buildings, for structures, for machines. And we have that same sort of professionalism in our career saying, how can we utilize these different tools, instruments, and I think most importantly, the resources available to help us achieve whatever it is we hope to achieve. So, um, Thanks, Larry, for sharing that, sprinkling a little bit of value on the table, which is something that I don't really focus on value investing. Again, it's a fantastic investment vehicle. It's just not something that fits my personality type. So, you know, bring on somebody else who's an expert at that. So if you want to know more, you can contact Online Training Academy. Larry teaches a whole bunch of different classes there. Um, I think this is uh, going to be a very exciting year. I'm looking forward to it. Of course, I am done for the year, meaning no more Trader Merlin shows. I'm not doing anything else for OTA because my classes are done today, which means... It's a nice frosty glass of whiskey and hopefully a very sad goodbye 
to 2021. Thank you guys so much for all your support this year. I think we've done 221 shows this year, 170 last year. I do more shows than anybody else in the financial space, all live, all free, and just about every single day. So thank you guys so much for your support over the years. I will see you all in 2022. Cheers.